Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm Ben Powell, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Uh, welcome to what will be our final public lecture of the semester. Uh, before I introduce tonight's program, I'll say that we are still finalizing the spring public lecture schedule, but the keynote address for that will take place on Tuesday, March 26th, when uh, Steve Forbes will be here in Lubbock to lecture with us. I hope you'll all be able to join us for that. Uh, for tonight's lecture, I'd also like to thank the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work, which houses our criminal uh, criminology program here at, uh, at Texas Tech University for co-sponsoring the event, and I welcome the students from that program here. And in particular, thank Patricia Maloney uh, for coordinating with us on this event. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce tonight's speaker. David Scarbeck is a professor of political science and political economy at Brown University. Uh, where he is also the director of the Center on Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at Brown. He is also the immediate past president of the Public Choice Society. Dave earned his PhD in economics from George Mason University and his bachelor's degree from San Jose State University, where I met him exactly 20 years ago this fall. Uh, his research examines how extra-legal governance institutions form, operate, and evolve. He's published extensively on the informal institutions that govern life in prisons in California and around the globe. His work has appeared in leading journals in political science, economics, and criminology. His first book, The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System, received the American Political Science Association's 2016 William Riker Award for the best book in political economy published in the previous three years. It was also awarded the 2014 Best Publication Award from the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime and was shortlisted for the British Sociological Association's Ethnography Award. His most recent book, The Puzzle of Prison Governance, Why Life Behind Bars Varies Around the World, which he is speaking on here tonight and which there's still about a dozen copies for sale outside. If in the course of his lecture you become interested enough in that book, you can exit and purchase and then have Dave devalue its resale value by signing it for you <laughs> after the lecture. And to be clear, the devaluation comes not from Dave's signature, but when he writes your name in it, because that limits your resale market to other people with the same name. This book won awards from the American Society of Criminology, the Academy of Criminal Justice Science, and the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime. His work has been widely featured in national and international media outlets, including The Atlantic, BBC, Business Insider, The Economist, Forbes, The Independent, The Times, among many other outlets. Please join me in welcoming Dave Scarbeck here. So thank you so much, uh, Ben, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be back at uh, Texas Tech. The first time I was here uh, was 10 years ago, uh, on this very date, actually. And it's been uh, very exciting to watch, mostly from afar, as the FMI has um, brought in some incredible faculty, some really important courses, uh, really sharp up-and-coming grad students, um, and to sort of appreciate uh, from a distance all the great things that you're doing here, Ben, so um, thank you. Um, today's talk is about this book, and I'm not going to talk about all the book, but just a few different pieces of it. Uh, the basic question of the book is, why does prison social order vary around the world? Um, in some places, prisoners themselves have a lot of solidarity, and they engage in collective action and have a tremendous impact on the day-to-day -day life of incarcerated people. In other places, they seem disorganized. They don't engage in collective action. They don't influence daily life within a facility. In some places, prisoners invest in extremely centralized institutions. They invest in uh, racially segregated prison gangs that have written rules, that have written constitutions. But in other prisons, they don't rely on those things. They rely on what today I'll call decentralized mechanisms. They rely on things like gossip, ostracism, and shaming in a very informal way to try to enforce social order. Why is that the case that it's so different? I find this question even more puzzling um, in, the fact, in the face of the fact that by definition and practice, prisons everywhere share some very common and important characteristics 
uh, there's a selection effect such that the people who come into a prison are not there randomly. They've been charged with or convicted of a crime. Um, there's also selection bias in that in prisons around the world, people overwhelmingly and disproportionately come from disadvantaged socioeconomic communities. Uh, when incarcerated, very often it's the case that you, you're forced to interact with other people. You don't get to choose who to live among. And finally, prisons everywhere, there are very few exit options. And so each of those, in a sort of simple day-to-day -day sense, seem to me intuitively to be very important. But also from a social science perspective, those four factors are things that we often point to uh, to explain when social order emerges in good ways um, and, or in bad ways. So they seem theoretically and empirically very important. So why, in the face of this, does life behind bars vary so much? Um, my argument is going to be all based on the idea of governance institutions. Governance institutions define and enforce property rights, they facilitate agreements between individuals, and they aid in the production of collective or public goods. This is a picture of a housing unit in California. It's taken inside of a cell. And those bars are a form of governance, a form of security that officials provide. Uh, the individual in the green um, um, uniform is a correctional officer. It's his job to maintain the security and the safety of everyone in that housing unit. So a lot of the governance that incarcerated people need or want comes from officials. But I'm going to argue that for a variety of reasons, even when officials do their jobs well, which as I'll discuss, they often don't, prisoners often demand, invest, desire additional extra legal forms of governance. This is the housing unit in a California prison about 10 years ago during a period of tremendous overcrowding. Uh, pictures like this one were used to convince the Supreme Court that this was unconstitutional, a form of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, a dormitory like this would hold 150 to maybe 250 people, three people per bunk. Throughout the day, whether you're trying to take a nap, play cards, get a haircut, shower, you and your property would be very much exposed, potentially vulnerable to the actions of other people. Someone who might want to harm you or take your things. And so my argument is in an environment of vulnerability like this, it makes sense for people to invest time and energy on the margin to try to be a little bit more safer, to try to make their property a little more secure, even when officials are doing the best that they can. And by the way, for a dormitory like this, it would be unlikely to have at most um, no more than three correctional officers maintaining security in a, in a room like this. In addition to protection, many incarcerated people have a demand for goods and services that they can't acquire through legitimate means, through the commissary. These are some of the thousands of mobile phones confiscated from prisoners um, in, any, in any year in California. In addition to phones, there's often demand for drugs, alcohol, tobacco, tattoos, sex, a wide range of illicit goods and services that prisoners are not allowed to have, are not allowed to participate in, that's contraband. And in order to get that, they need to rely on the underground economy, they need to find um, ways of getting access from the outside world, getting these goods and services into the facility, negotiating a deal and making sure that it's carried out. And to do that, they need to invest in this extra legal governance to do so. So I want to sort of break this bigger question up into two smaller ones, and then I'll, I'll get into the cases where I think there's a lot of really rich uh, and important evidence. So for the first question, why is it that extra legal governance is more or less important? And I have a simple argument that's more correlational than, than causal, but the basic idea is that if officials provide resources, if they administer prisons competently, and they provide high quality governance, then incarcerated people themselves have very little incentive to invest in reproducing those successful efforts. On the other hand, if prison officials don't provide resources, they don't administer effectively, and they don't provide high quality governance institutions, then there's a gap in which it may make perfect sense for incarcerated people to invest to fill that gap that officials have left. And so today I'm going to talk through um, you know, somewhat quickly, a few different cases. Uh, a case of a prison in Bolivia, a historical case of a prisoner of war camp in Andersonville, and uh, the Nordic prison system. The second piece of this bigger question is, when do people rely on these decentralized mechanisms like gossip, ostracism, and shaming to enforce social order? And the basic argument is that in small prison populations, these tools are really effective. 
It's easy to gossip about someone when everyone knows someone's reputation and it hurts them. It's painful to ostracize someone if there's no one else that you can turn to after you've been ostracized. And so those provide powerful incentives to follow the informal norms, the informal rules that all incarcerated people are aware of. But in big populations, these things become much less effective. If you don't know somebody else's reputation, then when someone gossips about them, it doesn't necessarily hurt them. It doesn't necessarily come to their ears. If you're ostracized in a large group, some small number of people may not want to associate with you, but you may be able to turn to some other group of people. So it's these sort of informal tools become less effective. I think that people are going to invest more in more centralized institutions that are explicitly designed to carry out this sort of monitoring and enforcement. And so I'm going to just look at two cases where the informal norms work best. I'm going to look at women's prisons in California and men's prisons um, in England. Before getting to the cases, I just want to make a brief note, uh, a methodological argument, which is that the vast, vast majority of prison ethnographies take place at a single prison facility. And it provides rich and deep and new knowledge about life in those particular places, but there's very little looking across different cases. And so the methodological argument in this book is that we can use existing single-site ethnographies as data in a broader comparative analysis, something that we in comparative politics have been doing for essentially the last 50 years. And so in the book, um, I look at 15 core case studies. They're complemented with dozens of shadow cases. And I conduct some of my own original historical research, which I'll discuss today. I'm not going to walk through all of these, but this is all the cases that I look at in the book. And I select them based on what I think the best explanatory variables are. And so I'm going to pick out just sort of four of these, walk through them a little bit over the next um, 30 or so minutes, um, and then open it up for questions and, and engagement. So I want to start in Latin America. And I'm going to speak in a very abstract and general level. So let me just caveat first that there's a lot of local variation. There's variation within the continent and within particular states. But in general, Latin American prisons um, are pretty impoverished places. Um, many Latin American prisons are extremely overcrowded. Three, four, five times the design capacity. People are crammed into prison cells and housing areas. They're also woefully understaffed, or at very least incredibly understaffed, in that often there'll be one correctional officer for, to oversee the, the life of hundreds and sometimes thousands of incarcerated people. So there's very limited and minimal guard presence within Latin American prisons. Um, they suffer, as this picture indicates to some degree, extreme poverty, very little access to food, clean water, health care, basic amenities. Very little is available to them. Officials provide very little. As a result of lack of access to um, sanitary products and health care, many of these Latin American prisons are incredibly unhygienic. Um, many of them are falling down in disrepair, uh, turning them into very dangerous places. Think of open electricity and sprinkling water happening where you live, next to where you sleep. So a very low level of resources, administration, and governance. Again, speaking in a, at the very sort of highest level, um, the extra legal governance or prisoner governance across Latin America is pronounced. It's incredibly important. Um, I'm going to show you some names of groups that, that exist in this small sample of countries. There's a lots of other ones, but I just selected some to throw out. Um, so across these different prison systems, guard presence is often very limited or entirely absent. In its place are Committees of Order and Discipline in Guatemala, Internal Chiefs in Colombia, Delegates in Peru, a variety of different types of prisoner-run governance organizations. They vary in their effectiveness, they vary in their legitimacy, they vary in their criminality, but what's important is that the prisons are not run by prison officials, but for the most part, by prisoners themselves. So there's a gap in the governance provided by officials, and the incarcerated people step in to fill that gap. That's at a very high level. I want to zoom in on a particular facility to give you a sense about some of the detail. This is San Pedro Prison. Um, it's in the capital city in Bolivia. From the outside, it looks like many Western prisons. Large foreboding walls. There are correctional officers um, there in sort of military-style guard on the front. And they regulate entry into and out of the prison. 
However, when one enters the prison, guard presence disappears and is in fact not present. There are no guards maintaining order inside of the prison. The National Lawyers Guild says that the prison administration provides no rehabilitation services, no schools, and minimal health care. They likewise cite that inmates have complete freedom of movement within the prison. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights reports that food is not properly prepared. It leads to epidemics and infections. The food is also insufficient, obliging many prisoners to pay for their own food if they have the money to do so. <clears throat> this is um, some of the gruel like substance, as it's described, um, that is provided free of charge to prisoners on a daily basis. If you look at the prison facility from uh, a raised angle, you can see that there are eight different housing sections within this facility. And one of the unique things about many Latin American prisons is that just because you're incarcerated doesn't mean you have the right to a prison cell or even a prison bed. Um, in this prison, um, incarcerated people are obliged to pay for, to purchase a place to live. Sometimes that's a mat on somebody else's um, cell. Maybe it's a cell uh, uh, that are cells. They vary tremendously in quality. Prisoners who own cells can modify them. They can add locks to the doors. They can knock down a wall and connect two adjacent um, cells. And after purchasing these, when someone's released, they can then sell their home to another incarcerated person. Within each housing section, there are uh, committees designed to govern these spaces. These committees are often in charge of maintaining housing records, so who owns which cells and why, when was it purchased, for how much. The committees engage in resolving disputes between local residents. They often organize education and entertainment opportunities. And the representatives that serve on these committees are elected members of property owners in each housing section. Um, to provide a, a description from the National Lawyers Guild, each section has the feel of a neighborhood or even a small village with its own courtyard, plaza, and shops. The committee in charge of each section manages it, repairing the sidewalks or painting the walls. Each directiva sets an assessment charge for prisoners in the section, and each committee is responsible for its own budget. Inmates pay for all services. In addition to these sort of housing markets and local you know, homeowners associations, for lack of a better word, uh, there's also a sort of strangely laissez-faire market within the prison because there are no guards regulating what people do. Incarcerated people set up different businesses and shops. One individual explains there's cooks, painters, restaurateurs, carpenters, electricians, cleaners, accountants, and doctors. Uh, this table provides a more enticing alternative to the gruel-like substance that's provided with the hitch that you have to be able to pay for it. The prison's certainly not perfect uh, or violence-free, but another unique aspect to Latin American prisons is in most states, um, children of incarcerated people are allowed to live with an incarcerated parent. Uh, I believe that in Bolivia, the age limit is eight years old, uh, but in practice, that's never enforced, and there are children of all ages living within San Pedro prison. Depending on the time of year, there's two to 400 children residing in there, more around holidays as uh, young people want to come and visit uh, family members. The kids usually leave during the day and they go out to schools and then make their way back in the afternoon uh, where they'll, they'll play and have dinner um, with uh, a father. Mothers are also allowed to reside with an incarcerated father, so it's often a family, uh, a sort of nuclear family uh, within the prison. The parents have created uh, a parents association. They organize educational uh, games and cultural activities but they also create rules for what they expect other prisoners to follow when around or that might affect uh, the kids who live in the prison. Um, one formerly incarcerated person there told me uh, that the most important one is no fighting in the presence of children. And he described several instances where people would be um, pushing and shoving or maybe throwing fists and some little kid would come running along and they would just sort of pause and then the kid squirrels along and then they start back at, at the fight. So this is not a perfect or perfectly enforced system, um, but there are people striving in a really difficult situation to try to make their life a little bit better, to try to find a little more order, find a rule that can make uh, what's clearly a very difficult situation hopefully a little bit better. Um, the extra legal governance arises in a few different ways, these housing sections, parents association markets, and in a variety of different ways, they create incentives and information 
to improve um, a little bit life within the prison. If you can add an extra lock to your door, maybe that makes you feel more secure. Maybe you're willing to sort of collect some more things that you care about. Um, if the quality and the price of your house depends on the rules governing your community, there's at least a chance that you'll care about trying to get the right rules in place. And the ability to engage in market activity uh, doesn't eliminate the opportunity to benefit yourself through predatory action, but it opens up another venue, another set of opportunities, which is the ability to engage in positive sum interactions. Uh, a few pesos for a better meal, and a better meal for a few pesos. So that's one very extreme situation where officials don't govern at all, and these are some of the mechanisms uh, that emerge in its place, in its absence. I want to now go to the sort of full other extreme side of this uh, characteristic, which is to look at the Nordic prison systems. Is anyone familiar with the Nordic prison systems? Read about it? They're sort of well known, lots of people are excited about them. Whether we can do something like that here is always a big question that I'm a little skeptical about. Um, but their prisons are governed in a wildly different way. Their prisons are very small, often much fewer than 100 people, I think about 60 or 70 on average. Some Nordic prisons hold 15 or 20 people. There's no overcrowding, the national um, um, design, the national capacity rate is at 60 or 70 percent these days. There's usually more staff from the prison in a facility than there are prisoners themselves. And for the most part, these people are well trained, they're paid well, they receive much more education and training than correctional officers in this country. And being a correctional officer in Nordic countries is seen as sort of doing a civic duty. You know, sort of like if we think about public school education, it's like, no, that's like a good job, that's good for society that's happening. And so getting people who care into these facilities is a priority in, in Nordic culture. Uh, the programming available is also vast by comparisons to any correctional uh, system. They're very well fed, they have access to extensive education programs, uh, they often receive vocational training, and there's a variety of different um, entertainment options available. This is a picture of a maximum security prison cell in Oslo. Um, there's a bed on the right, there's uh, an intercom uh, next to the bed, there's a little TV on the top right, flat screen, uh, a little writing desk in front of a sun-filled window. Um, I like to joke with my colleagues that it's nicer than the undergraduate accommodations at Brown. <laughs> um, this is a, a common area um, where they can socialize. Many of the Nordic prisons, although certainly not all of them, have kitchens where incarcerated people can prepare their own meals. In some of the lowest security prisons, they're able to leave the prison, go to the grocery store, get the groceries that they want, and bring them back. And these kitchens are full of all the standard uh, equipment, including knives. Um, and this is the new gymnasium that they have, which includes uh, basketball and uh, field hockey and a climbing wall. And so this is a shockingly different situation that these incarcerated people are faced with compared to the Bolivian case. They don't have housing committees. They don't have little markets set up. They don't have a parents association. The state, in this instance, provides a tremendous amount of material resources. Um, the people who work in the prisons are very well trained and care about administrating them in uh, competent ways. And the governance of social and economic life in these facilities is, is about, I guess, as good as you could possibly hope for within the carceral context. So where the state provides this very well, the extra legal governance um, does not seem to emerge, at least not in Nordic countries. I'm not making an argument that when the state doesn't govern, things are always going to work out fine, and I think there's lots of problems with Bolivia. But I wanted to sort of dig into a case where extra legal governance fails, and uh, just sort of look at, for this particular instance, why did it fail? And, and that's not to say it's going to generalize for all the failures, but what might go wrong? Um, this is Andersonville Prison. It was a Confederate POW camp that was opened in the last 14 months of the American Civil War. Uh, the evidence that I'll provide to you comes from a variety of sources, but there's a 128 volume of all of the correspondence and most of the paperwork in the Civil War from both sides. It's this incredible resource that's available to historians. You can't just use that, but there's a tremendous amount of really first-rate archival material. It's all on PDF now, really interesting source. So I use that, prisoner diaries, data from archives, 
and existing uh, histories of Andersonville POW camp. Why was Anderson a failure? The most obvious reason why I would call it a failure is because of the tremendous fatality rate of people who were housed there. It held, over those 14 months, about 45,000 prisoners. Uh, nearly 13,000 of those people died, about 30% of its residents. In the north, the only POW camp to rival that was Elmira Prison, uh, which had a death rate of about 25%, so very high. Um, they were dealing with a, fall, a smaller absolute number, um, but, but this is a place of tremendous suffering and death. On average, 13 deaths per day. The deadliest day was August 23rd, 1864, when 127 people died. Many of these deaths were from incredibly preventable causes, things like starvation, diarrhea, scurvy, dysentery, and gangrene. Uh, the picture here is um, taken while the camp was in operation. All of the photos that I'll show you are from August 17th, 1864, and this was a camp cemetery. So why was this place such a deadly failure? The first, and I think most common explanation, is because it was tremendously overcrowded. Um, the camp itself is basically just, uh, uh, just a just floor with a bunch of walls thrown up. It was an open field. And it was about as big as 10 American football fields, but at the height of crowding, that was only about four square feet per person, which is actually smaller than a modern or contemporary Western um, housing cell in a prison. The prison was also woefully unprepared for this vast number of people to enter its gates. There was no infrastructure, like streets. There were no barracks for people to sleep in. There was no canteen for food, no sewage waste system, or a supply chain to bring necessary resources from the outside into the facility. Uh, one of the three main um, leaders of the Confederate Army at this uh, facility, uh, we can see in his archives, he's writing desperately to other um, posts. He says, in the interior of the prison, there's not an ax, a hoe, a spade, a shovel. Um, in the same, there's quartered about 8,000 people. We've got no supplies and lots of people. In another, he writes passionately, I'm so seriously in need of funds that I do not know what I shall do. For God's sake, send me 100,000 for prisoners of war and 75,000 for pay of officers and troops stationed here. If only you knew what trouble I was in here for the want of funds. No help was available. In addition to lack of resources, there was not a staff, there were not guards, there were not officials there to regulate, to help, to assist, to rehabilitate. Um, if you look along the top row, um, there were guard stations. I think there's maybe four poking out up top. They call them pigeon roosts. These were the, the soldiers at the end of a very long, very bloody war who were too wounded, too older, too incompetent to put on a deadly military line. In one report, uh, an inspector calls them as raw as troops could be. In other words, not a source of assistance, of security. Um, the men housed here had little food, and unlike the case of in Bolivia, they had no access to economic resources. One prisoner writes in his diary, men actually starved to death here for want of food. There was no access. The food and the resources in San Pedro, it came from the outside world. For a small bribe, friends, family members could enter the facility. They could bring resources in. They could share resources with loved ones. They could give loved one resources to then sell in the prison. That wasn't allowed here. There was no sort of international exchange from within the prison to outside of the prison. It was fully blocked off for a variety of reasons. There was no access allowed officially. Many of the family members of people incarcerated here had no idea that they were incarcerated or where they specifically were. And these men were captives in hostile territory, so far from home in a time when transportation costs were so high. Um, the prison itself it was a filthy, foul-smelling, and infested place. One camp surgeon reported that, with but few exceptions, uh, the people are very filthy, and clothing did not seem to appreciate the great necessity of bathing. A particularly cruel observation, given that they were never given soap or water or a clean place to bathe by officials, and they had at very little, essentially no access to clean water themselves. One visitor to Andersonville says, it's a singular sight to look down into this enclosure. The suffering within both mind and body is fearful, and one can only compare it 
to a Hades on Earth. So I've told you some really terrible stuff, and I apologize for that. Um, but it, it was a failure, and it failed in lots of ways that it maybe didn't need to fail. Uh, so I want to just sort of draw a stark contrast with that Bolivian prison. There, they had the opportunity to exchange, buy and sell goods and services, and here they didn't. At the start of incarceration at the POW camp, there were natural resources that people could use, chop down a tree to start a fire. All of those were very quickly eaten up and used and consumed. There were a few forms of civil society. Uh, we don't see parents' associations, obviously, but we also don't even see lots of religious organization in, San, uh, in the POW camp and very little political or social organization. And so I want to sort of just, in contrast with San Pedro, ask why is it that there wasn't some proliferation or even emergence of any extra legal governance? And I think there's a few culprits that, that tend to explain it based on the historical record. Um, like I said at first, there's no trade with the outside world. There was a very hard constraint on access to resources, and when it was empty, it was empty. There's nothing else to turn to. Um, they didn't invest in regulation and security because there was, in a sense, few opportunities for crime in the POW camp. Most of the men were sick and were dying. There wasn't a lot of violent crime to take place. And they were so impoverished that there was no need to prevent property crime because people had so little, for the most part. Um, and what I think made all this worse is that throughout the camp, week after week, based on what we see in the diaries, there were always rumors swirling about incarcerated people. We're going to be exchanged soon. We're going to go free soon. This is a big part of the Civil War, the idea if we kept exchanging POWs, the war would never end. And there was an argument that we need to just stop exchanging them. But these desperate men, always hopeful, um, never believed it. They never had good reason to believe that they would be exchanged next week. Next week. Uh, but in a desperate situation, that, um, that made them think that they were going to leave soon. And it didn't make sense to invest in these institutions over a long run if you were going to be let free the next day. So just because prisons don't provide lots of resources or effective governance, that's not some automatic conclusion that, oh, don't worry, there's going to be a lot of extra legal governance. There's going to be a lot of resources. There are other things, other binding constraints that suppress the ability for these sorts of emergent institutions to, to come out and to be effective. So I want to sort of jump from this sad historical case to a more con contemporary period, uh, which is the men's English prison system. Um, and what in particular do, does the informal life look like for men's prisons in England? One thing that's a big difference between gangs in the United States, or excuse me, prisons in the United States and prisons in England is that England doesn't have prison gangs like we do in many of the states here. One of the leading sociologists in England summarizes her work, there appears to be no recognizable equivalent of the organized US gang. Um, based on the words of incarcerated people in England, definitely not a gang scene going on. It's not like there's really a gang that runs the prison. Where you heard of this gang thing? I don't know nothing about that. It ain't nothing like America with the Bloods and Crips. So in England, they don't have these important centralized organizations, these groups. So what do they rely on instead? Well, the extra legal governance that emerges there, not centralized, is much more decentralized. And individual's indi individual reputation matters most. A person standing in the eyes of his peer is really important. And if you keep violating social norms, if you treat people poorly, your reputation is going to fall. And people are going to not want to associate with you. They're going to shun you. They're not going to have your back. And that's going to make you less safe, less comfortable while incarcerated. People would have loose affiliations, two or three or four people. But they weren't permanent um, connections. They weren't lifetime commitments like many of America's prison gangs demand from their members. The gangs, groups, associations, affiliations, they're not based strictly on ethnicity and race, like in many places in California, but instead on the UK equivalent of zip codes, postcodes. Except for postcodes are much more um, um, circumscribed than zip codes. Zip codes cover usually about 8,000 properties. In the UK, postcodes cover about 15 properties, much smaller. 
And so what that means is that when people affiliate in prisons in England, they're affiliating with people that they lived next to before being incarcerated. Um, affiliations, you know, like I said, was not permanent. There was overlapping. I'm friends with these guys. They're my, the football team I support. I'll hang out with them. So very informal, not racially divided like the United States, no gangs like the United States. And related to this last point, drug dealing in English men's prisons is a sole proprietor business. Whereas in California, Texas, New York, Chicago, it's big gangs that create, um, um, that, that sell the drugs and they, 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 they're like a McDonald's of drug selling in prisons. That, not, that doesn't happen here. Um, so these extra legal institutions are radically decentralized based on an individual's reputation, not organized around stark racial divides. So why is that the case? The basic answer is that prisons are small enough that you know people's reputation and they know yours, and so you have an incentive to stay in good standing with your peers. Um, this is one way of looking at it. This is just the average size, the average number of people in prisons in different countries. Um, in California, you know, it's been higher than that, but it's a, several thousand people. In England and Wales, about 700. And the Nordic countries, some of them, uh, much lower. So in small populations, you can rely on shame and ostracism really effectively. And you can avoid some of the ugliest parts of uh, the extra legal governance of big prisons. Uh, this is just a histogram. It just shows for the English prison system how many prisons hold X number of people based on the, the lower part there. I can't actually see from where I'm standing, but I think it's like six or seven hundred people is the tallest bar, meaning that's the most common size uh, prison in England. And in England, they do a better job of separating out a prison, so it's not 600 people all living in the same housing area, but actually closer to something like many different 50-person units. So the number of people you're interacting with is much smaller, allowing them to leverage these sort of reputation mechanisms. Just to give some sense, I mean, you might ask, you know, what's the context? Is this, is this small or large? And so this is a histogram for the uh, state of California. And so what this tells you is that they have many fewer prisons that are all much larger. The smallest prison in California is still larger than the largest prison in England. And the largest prisons in California are twice as large as the largest prison in England. Did I say that right? The largest prison in California is twice as big as the biggest prison in England. So in California, they can't rely on reputation and gossip and ostracism. And so they turn to these gangs. England has a, an additional advantage for their extra legal governance institutions, um, which we can trace back to 1991, the Wolf Report, which is a famous um, UK report um, originated in the Ministry of Justice. And it was basically like, how do we want to do prisons now? Let's revamp, let's rethink. And this was one of the central tenets. Prisons should be community prisons sided within reasonable proximity to the community with which the prisoners they hold have their closest links. You should be locked up in prisons close to where you came from. So what that means is that you may associate people with your zip code while you're there, but everyone from your zip code, if they get incarcerated, they're going to that same prison. That means that the people that you knew before you got to prison um, may be in prison when you get there. And when you leave prison, the people who left before you will know how you acted while you were there. So it extends the time horizon of interactions. It expands the audience. As incarcerated people can gossip with their family and the family of other incarcerated people about who's behaving well and who's behaving poorly in, uh, in, in, the, in the unit. They're able to do this. By the way, in California, the typical um, intuition is that you send people as far away as where they're from so that they get away from the bad influences that led them to uh, end up in prison in the first place. Um, so England's able to do this, as I mentioned, because they have far more prisons uh, than they do in a place like California. California has about 34 prisons. They're spread throughout the state. Um, England and Wales has about 120 prisons, also spread throughout the country. but. Basically, England and Wales has about three and a half times as many facilities, and they're spread throughout a geographic area that is about only a third of the size of California. So in England, you can genuinely send someone to a community cited in a uh, prison cited in the community that you're from. Uh, but in California, so much larger, so fewer places, that's not possible. And so there's pre-prison social networks that facilitate this reputation mechanism. 
There's knowledge of future um, interactions, future reputation reading by other audiences that takes the power of shame and gossip and ostracism and turns the dial way up. It makes it work really well. Um, as one incarcerated person explains, I like to be around people who are probably where I'm from. So the chance of me knowing them is high and everything, or we have more in common and stuff like that. A very, uh, that is a very standard, very uh, frequent description of the informal life and associations in English prisons. Um, they also don't rely on rigid ethnic or racial segregation. And there's a bunch of quotes that sort of substantiate this from all sorts of different prisons. And that's striking in part um, because of how rigid and strict racial and ethnic divisions are in many US prison systems. And many people have argued that it's because of the size uh, of these prisons, the inability to know individuals, that they turn to these um, less informative, more easily observable characteristics. So that's English men's prisons. The last um, case is just to look into the case of women's prisons. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the television show, Orange is the New Black. I watch it uh, for research purposes. Um, the first season's okay, the other one's, I think, uh, not as good. And part of the reason is because the first season is based on um, uh, Piper Kerman's actual memoir of her actual experience uh, in a women's prison. And if you read her memoir, it tracks and dovetails in very plausible and reasonable ways with um, the research on women's prisons and the extra-legal institutions in women's prisons. And so what the memoir and the broader literature find is that in many ways, um, women organize their informal life uh, a lot like English men's prisons. Um, I think most importantly that it's the individual standing that matters, that reputation matters a lot. And if you violate the social norms, people don't like that and they're not going to like you. And if you follow them, um, maybe they will like you, and maybe they'll let you spend time with them and share resources with you. Um, in women's prisons, um, some form play families, fictive kinships, where someone will take on the role of the mom, or the dad, or the, 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 the kid, and um, they'll pre sort of play family, pretend family. Um, these are not rigid, um, like some real families, they're fleeting and loose affiliations. People join and leave families, kids are adopted and left behind. Um, and the families are not mutually exclusive. There's a whole family tree of interconnected groups of fictive kinships. Um, and they're, they're carried out across racial lines. And so what's important here is that this is an individual-based system. And it works um, even despite the fact that the size of women's prison population has grown dramatically in California uh, over the past uh, decades and century. Uh, but to note that even though there's been tremendous increase in the women's prison population, um, the, at the height, it's still a very small size compared to uh, men's prison systems in California. So men used to rely on this individual reputation-based system a long, long time ago in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, but as their prison population started to grow, they couldn't do that. Women's prison populations have never grown so high that they can't rely on those things. So, that's a very sort of scattershot um, description of how much variation there is in the informal life of prisons, of the culture, the norms, and the rules uh, that operate within them. Um, the goal of the book is to sort of offer a new um, observation and a new suggestion or theory about why the extra legal life behind bars varies tremendously so much across prisons and through time. Extra-legal governance um, is sometimes a al fantastic alternative. I think that if the prisoners in Bolivia didn't have access to all of these other resources and administration and governance institutions, they would clearly be worse off. Um, but as I've thought more about this, I also think it's important to sort of caveat that just because someone's better off under one situation certainly doesn't mean that it's ideal, or even that it's the only characteristic that we should think about. So one challenge to extra-legal governance is that they often offer few systems of accountability. There are no appeals processes if other prisoners decide that you deserve a meeting or to be killed. Often there's no due process in that you may not even know that you're on trial for some crime. 
It's also probably fair to say that lots of extra legal governance in prison is rewarding people most willing to engage in dangerous behavior to other people. Um, so as social scientists and thinking not just as an economist or political scientist or a sociologist, you know, I think that this literature needs to develop more criteria, more multifaceted, multidimensional criteria for judging uh, in what ways is extra legal governance good or better? In what ways is it undesirable or where there's room for improvement? Um, finally, I, I sort of hope that prison ethnography will take more of a comparative turn. Don't just look at, at one prison and, and that's it. I think that there's genuine, real knowledge that we can learn and that we can transfer from one case to another, something that many ethnographers are very hesitant to uh, agree to. Um, there's been very little, maybe no, um, comparative work in this prison ethnography um, sort of idea. And so um, the book is in some ways making two arguments, and I'll be happy if either one of them makes sense. One is a theory for what explains the change. The other is just a methodological argument that, hey, we should be comparing across cases, and here's my first attempt to do so. Show me how, how to do it better. Um, so with that, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions, and thank you so much for your uh, attention.